This is the Guided Podcast, an interview with the fly fishing industry's top guides and brand ambassadors. On this podcast, we cover topics such as the guiding lifestyle, conservation, different fisheries globally, and gear and technology to improve your game. I'm your show host, Greg Keenan. Before we begin today's show, let's thank our sponsors. Scientific Anglers is the leader in producing the world's best fly lines for over 75 years. Scientific Anglers have set new industry standards with their SA Amplitude family of fly lines, both in technology and performance. See the difference for yourself today at scientificanglers.com. Show your show support and follow us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to Guided. Today, our guest is John Ray from Michigan, USA. John, how are you, bud? Good, Greg. How you doing? Good, man. Good. You know, I I always got to ask, how you are? You guys staying? Are you tongue tied? Eh? Are you staying safe out there? Yes, we're we're doing we're doing the best we can. It's definitely uh, an interesting time, to say the least. No doubt, no doubt. I know you've been. Uh, impacted and your state's been deeply impacted but uh do you have any quick stories about how you know your state's given back to the guides that have been impacted out in michigan yeah um it's it's definitely been something where you're motivated or um there's been a lot of caring out there and your feelings have been touched as a lot of people have reached out to you from the local fly shops to customers uh so back in march when we were shut down march 27th uh which was our peak kind of spring steelhead season and we're just you know starting to roll through that after coming out of a long cold michigan winter we were uh hit by the pandemic and the community which is pretty much probably everywhere in the united states really tight knit came together and there was a lot of raffles that went out and um, customers would reach out to you kind of not like on a daily basis, but a weekly basis and just touching base with you and making sure that, you know, did you want deposits? So um, that was, you know, very touching. And it, it led you to then try to give back to them by creating content and making sure that you're updating your website and, trying to do Instagram posts that weren't brag board anymore, but, you know, helpful hints on fly tying and things like that. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. That's, you know, that the community, the state, everybody kind of rallied together for you guys. So um, I just, I just love that. I just love that authenticity and that positivity. So, you know, it's funny. You just mentioned that um, you're, you you came out of your steelhead season. So now what are you, you're into your trout season right now, or are you into a, a different season? Yeah, so uh, here in Michigan, uh, probably one of the strengths of the state is just the diversity. So as I mentioned earlier, you have our our steelhead season, and the spring season is kind of the coming of the close of the steelhead run. So March and April are that peak spring season, and then we start to transition into trout. At the end of April, uh, we get water temps that are going to start kicking off the aquatic bugs in you're going to be able to match the hatch a little bit earlier in the year before the hatches. Of course, you're, you know, you're doing your streamer program and hitting the high water and fishing the insides, looking for trout that are trying to put on the pounds. So April um, starts off the trout season, goes all the way through May where we're, you know, fishing all the bugs. And then June probably it comes to a, a peak and we have uh, the big bugs show up, Isonychias, brown drakes, and hex. And hex just pretty much ended for us this week. And I was nervous when I got the email from you that uh, we were scheduling this podcast and you're going to get a little bit of grumpy guide disease. So work until 4 a.m. And, you know, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. isn't my strength. So I was 
trying to figure out, I was like, okay, when I, when can I schedule Greg in there? So I'm glad you could fit me in after it was done and I could get my rest and get more into my daily routine of early mornings. That's funny. Well, you know what, John, it's all good, man. We made it work. We're making it work right now. So I love it. So now, you know, it's funny because you mentioned the state of the state has so much diversity and that's just kind of cool. What are, what are some of the, the primary species when you take your clients out, um, that you are targeting? I know you mentioned steelhead and bass is, or sorry, steelhead bass and, uh, and trout is right now. Are you entering your bass season or? Yeah, we're, uh, just for me, the Manistee River, which is my home river, temperatures have gotten such where the bass, um, and this next point isn't uh, proven, but after 18 years of fishing for them, uh, bass are migratory. And just like steelhead and salmon, um, they'll come in from Lake Michigan and they'll travel up the Manistee River. And I believe that they're hunting for forage food. And there's a big pull during the full moon process of the crayfish molt. So the crayfish have to, you know, send off some sort of pheromone or scent, you know, baby lobsters Mm -hmm. crawling all over the rock bottom definitely have to trigger something. So these bass show up after spawning and they come in and they, they feed on minnows that are in the river. They feed on crayfish that are in the river and they, they do this not only from Lake Michigan into the lower 33 miles of the Manistee, but also there's an impoundment from Tippy that goes up into what we call the Hoden Pile section. And those bass will migrate out of Tippy Pond going into the lower end of that section of the river, also doing the same thing. So we probably have close to 40 to 45 miles of smallmouth water that we can hunt these fish that are migratory in the season for them. The temperatures are ideal. The crayfish are molting. The minnows are there. And, you know, it's pretty good mid- Midwest bass fishing. That sounds, uh, you're making me want to go. So these bass, I mean, they're just eating pure protein. So are they like a healthy bass? Like, are they big? Are they healthy? Like, what's your average? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah. So in Michigan, uh, the viewership that is familiar with the setup, the, the biggest bass that definitely are on the east side of the state. Uh, the Manistee River, uh, I would say that from the tippy down, which is, I always call it kind of the wiggle section. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a high number, uh, really good for, you know, 20, 30 bass per day is pretty common. Those fish are going to probably max out at 14 to 15 inches, uh, but you will have a bass or two that's in the 18 inch range, but it gives the opportunity where we can take uh, a beginner, a kid, also uh, what I believe bass provide the opportunity to the angler is being diverse in the program. So a lot of people might not have streamer fished yet for trout, but they want to learn how to streamer fish. So if we can take that individual and take them on a smallmouth trip and then get them into a high number situation, we can build confidence on streamer fishing. So back to the trout scenario in Michigan, mm-hmm. when we go uh, trout fishing with streamers, it's definitely not a numbers game, but we have, have pretty trout here, uh, common to Sea fish, you know, 22, 24 with the occasional, you know, donkey size, 26. But those fish are far in between. A lot of cast, a lot of technique, a lot of ability is required to, to turn those fish, hook those fish, and play those fish. So smallmouth, what I've always tried to teach, gives you that ability to learn those skill sets that when you go in the spring and in the fall for trout, that you have that base underneath you. So putting people into the numbers game that the Manistee offers tippy down and teaching them the skill set of stripping and pausing the fly and working with a fish in that cat mouth game builds confidence. And, you know, you can make mistakes, but still have another opportunity in a couple more casts when another one shows up, unlike on a trout river where it might be hours between opportunities. You know, John, I think I got to ask you just like from my own knowledge too, um, having, 
like bass and where I'm from British Columbia here in, in Canada, I, I mean, they're an invasive species and we have like maybe a handful of areas where they are. Um, so it's just a, a species that I haven't fished for. So walk me through like how I would fish for these bass. Like am I, am I trout setting for them? Like when I'm, as I'm streamer fishing, I'm, I'm stripping, pausing, like you mentioned. And then do I, do I trout set? Do it? Is it, is it a strip set? Like, like how's that all come into play? Is it a short leader, long leader? Um, yeah. Well, like walk me through how I would do that successfully from your experience. Sure. So Greg, please ask a lot of those questions again, as I go through this, if I missed yeah, one of them, of course, yeah. so I'm going to do my best as my <laughs> ADHD kicks in as we're talking about fishing here. But, uh, so smallmouth bass are, come back to when people ask me like, John, why do you like fly fishing? So the opportunity to move a fly and see the fish eat it falls right into my wheelhouse. Having something very deep in the water column and not seeing it and just waiting isn't something that I, I have those programs, but I'm not really, you know, I would, I'm not going to pick that up first. Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing that, I'll probably do is set up the rod. So I always probably grab a nine foot six, nine foot seven. And then if I'm setting up the boat to take somebody fishing and, you know, bear with me here. If you're listening to this, you don't have to have these three lines, but I always show up first with a sink tip. So my being from Michigan and having kind of cold water, the first one I'm always going to grab is the sonar 25. 200 or 250 and that's my first my sink tip and i'll go into some of the leader setups here in a second the next one which is my favorite is their uh full intermediate which is going to allow me to play that fly at that just under six inches underneath the, the surface game so i'll grab that in a six or a seven and then the titan uh either long or the classic bass bug one that is the floating line. So when we can get those fish on poppers. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Bass, bass are very visual. Mm -hmm. So having clean water is ideal. Dirty water, you have to play a little bit different game. So top water is a great way to bring them up. Chugging a bass popper on the Titan. Um, I play what, uh, there's a series of flies that I tie that's not searchable if you look up banjo minnow. But if you're familiar with some of the soft plastics out there, I love to fish a bait that just sinks very slightly with a little bit of bead chain. And then you kind of keep that fly six inches below the surface. So that's where that uh, intermediate really plays in because it breaks that surface tension. You run probably like a nine foot leader, 10 pound to the end of it. So you don't have to be bashful. And you keep that fly just injured into the, all the structure. And the Manistee River is an old logging river back in the day from Chicago. And so these fish have tons of structure to go into. It's, if you're from British Columbia, which I haven't been there, but I always, always welcome seen the videos on. <laughs> always, yeah, as soon as Canada lets me in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it's more rock there. So here in the Midwest, I have my structure is wood. Mm -hmm. And so those fish will hold off, you know, the log jams that we have, individual stumps, stuff like that. So taking that fly and not getting it super deep, you don't get hung up as much. And then you can pull those fish up because they're very aggressive and they love to pack on the pounds, like you said before. Yeah, the other thing yeah, that yeah. as a as an angler that is a little bit different for bass that I don't think I stumbled on right away was that what smallmouth bass have taught me is where I can swing for steelhead. And uh, you might be thinking to yourself like, well, where do I cast for bass? Well, bass will, will sit everywhere. But when you go down the river, one of my favorite things to do is like, you look at the river and maybe you have a trout scenario in your mind mm -hmm. and you're looking at like, wow, that water is really classic trout water on your left side. Well, where you can find bass a lot of times is on the right side of the river and maybe a little bit softer water, maybe not that classic look, but 
if you take that same spot and you fish it later in the winter for steelhead, you'll find steelhead in that water as well. Interesting. So the temps drop, those steelhead will slide over into that same type of structure because that minnow base, that food base that the smallmouth taught you is there is where we, I'll pick up a lot of my um, guide spots, maybe, yeah. where you're yeah. like, you know, you have a secret spot. So that's a helpful hint for anybody out there that's a bass fisherman that you can fish those same spots for steelhead later in the year. John, I, I love it. I think uh, a lot of guys are going to um, be hooking up some steelhead this winter. Thanks to you on that one. So what's, what's the leader mm-hmm. setup? Are, are bass like leader shy or is it heavy stout leaders or, or do you have your, yeah, or, or do you make your own? Like walk me through that. No, I, I, well, kind of, I guess you mean, you add a little bit, but yeah, that's, that's I'm pretty I'm much a, yeah. I'm a, yeah, I'm a classic. There's three techniques for smallmouth. One was the popper. So you're going to have this big balsa, um, plastic, rubber leg, marabou, twisting up leader mechanism that if you, this one was definitely not one that you read in a book either is that if you if you're casting a fly it doesn't matter if it's a dry fly a bass popper whatever and when you bring it in and you hold the leader and it's spinning like crazy and your leader is all twisted up and almost looks like spaghetti your leader's not strong enough so your tippet isn't strong enough so on the bass side, FA makes a couple bass leaders, but I'll also use some of the same leaders that I use for hex fishing. Mm-hmm. So your seven and a half foot OX, your seven and a half foot one X, you can use that same leader, which I'll I'll use for the hex fishing that we'll do here in June. But then you can bring it over to your bass popper setup. And you can take your tippet and you can add more 10 pounds to it. Now, usually this is one of the things that fly fishing drives me a little bit bonkers with is how complicated it is. So I use terms like OX and 1X, yeah. and that can be frustrating to learn. So let's just use pound here. So bass will like 10 pounds. And for me, there is a difference between SA's 2X in 10 pound that I can rip off a spool for saltwater fishing. So you're, you're going to want pretty stiff stuff, you know, and thinking stuff that won't break, um, that you can throw into structure, heavier tippet is definitely the way to go. A for your casting and then B for pulling fish out of structure. So that's your bass popper. The streamer program, when we're moving a streamer, I want a little bit longer leader. So usually I'll run towards like a nine foot leader. Again, going towards heavy tippets, you know, heavy eight pounds to like two X or one X again in um, moving that fly. But I want it to sink. So I want a little bit thinner diameter on my leader at the end. I also like that longer leader. So my fly has a little bit more movement in it. Uh, if I have to go deeper than my B chain I would and put on a cone head that also allows me to sink and get down just a little bit deeper. Uh, I talked about crayfish being earlier. So mimicking crayfish is pretty easy with a clouser minnow. You can keep it pretty simple by just, you know, running, you know, olive and orange clouser minnows close to the bottom on that same intermediate. And then the third tactic, which is my least favorite, but can be very productive, is the crabbing tactic. Very you the mimicking first out. If you want to set up a loss leader, uh, an indicator, or thing the bottom, and a heavy repeated eye that kind of bounces off the bottom. Smallmouth. Probably if you had 10 straight days of going small fishing, there's going to be one day where they're just very active. Yeah. And that's where crabbing for them can be productive. You will lose more flies that way, but it is definitely a very effective way to get smallmouth that are focused in on things that are on the bottom. John, ton of knowledge there. Ton of knowledge. I mean, I, yeah. 
Uh, my mind's blown here. Three effective ways to catch bass. I love it. So, you know what? Um, being in Michigan, you're so close to uh, SA headquarters here. Uh, a couple things with that. So, you are a um, advisor. Like, I mean, are you advising the the boys over there at SA uh, and and girls over there at SA about like your bass techniques? Like, walk me through what your role is with that. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things. You know, when you have the opportunity to talk at um, like TU groups or mm -hmm. shows around the Midwest here that we travel to and you'll do a seminar and I'm always pointing back to the most important thing in your arsenal is your fly line. And SA has done a fabulous job of, I don't know if like the skew numbers and maybe you agree or disagree with me here, but over the last seven to 10 years, think of the you know, of additional lines that have come out. Oh, yeah. When you and I were first starting at this, they made one spay line. They yeah. made one trout taper. They made one sinking something. And now they, they have all these lines to cater into almost every angler's opportunity to catch a fish at whatever depth, mm -hmm. whatever kind of cast or taper. Mm -hmm. And it can be overwhelming, but the one thing in Michigan that matches what SA is doing is the diversity that we have that a lot of these lines are tested right here in Michigan. From, you know, the carp lines out in the bay to the trout lines on the Manistee and the Asable to steelhead lines on the Muskegon. I mean, it's, you know, it's a constant, you know, give and take relationship. And that's been the fun part working with SA is that. I have the business to match the diversity in Michigan and then SA is willing to listen to what we're doing. And, you know, it's, you're constantly talking to the guys there and they're like, Hey, maybe you should try this line out. And then you pass that on to your customer and you pass that on in the shows that, Hey, you really do have to see this line. Like, you know, I bought a line, yesterday that's new which is the hover s2 s3 yeah yeah how, gonna be how perfect. is that like, to, like yeah how is that line i heard about yeah it. so yep so what it's going to do is it's going to allow me to fish that game changer style which mm -hmm. is blames you know i don't know how to word it properly but like he allowed us to make basically a lure out of a fly and it's got a gr great name associated with it but it's it's great for you know, all predator fish out there. But that fly likes to be fished, especially in the warmer waters, you know, like, you know, this bass frontier that we're going into, not very deep. So if you can have it just break the surface, but the full intermediate wasn't quite getting a deep, so much bulk on your fly, that two at three is going to allow that fly just to get down just a little bit and then yeah. still have the motion that you're, you're getting out of that bug so that's going to be the new one coming out next week for me as well and i saw a prototype i think this spring and i ran it so i was excited to get the the new finished product yeah i know i i saw that as well and i'm like oh i i definitely want to give it a shot for for something out here for i mean for our still waters just play around and try something with it so i mean i yeah i saw that um John, sounds like you got an important role over there, which is kind of cool. I got to ask you though, have you? Uh, you've, you've obviously been to the headquarters. Is there any fish in the in the lake where you guys are testing on on the SA property there? <laughs> I, I'm sure one of the boys has caught one or like put, you know, a pretty big goldfish there at some time. I haven't had the opportunity to have a fish rise yet, but I'm still making casts and hoping. So we'll I, see. It's, uh, you know, everyone has those bucket list destinations and this is, I know it's a weird <laughs> one for me, man. It's a weird one, but I definitely have a bucket list to go there because I know like Brad, Brad's office is probably like right, right off the, the balcony and just, just do a couple casts, you know? So it's funny. So. Yep. Just a couple. There you are. John, you know, you got lots going on you, and I love the teaching aspect that you've, that you've shown us today, especially with the bass and stuff. So what, what else do you got going on going forward here? Uh, coming through the rest of the summer, we'll uh, focus on the hoppers as well for trout, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, waters low and clear. So you can 
you know, those fish aren't targeting or going through the hatch cycle anymore. So we'll run that through, you know, August. And then I go on a, uh, a musky uh, adventure for the month of September. And I, I give that the old college try. Is those fish definitely uh, test your will. So, um, But I actually like that part of the chase has taught me a lot about predators as well. So it's, it's not a fish where you're in a numbers and the 10,000 casts are true with this one. And I love having it in my program. I don't think I could be like, I'm always impressed with Chris Willen and how many days he puts forth on the muskie. I like having it into my program, like I said, but I could not do it full time. So I like to have uh, the wiggle factor, I guess, too much in my program to give it a 365 effort. And then after that, we'll come home uh, from that and start focusing on steelhead fishing. So we'll break out uh, the swing rods and do a lot of that. And then we also have a, a float program as well that we run to, you know, because the Great Lakes fish are definitely egg eaters coming off the salmon. So mm -hmm. the early stuff is definitely a lot of indicator. And then we'll have, have the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, hunker down and get out and fish as much as you can, but you know, what will 2020 bring us this winter? We're not sure yet. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to leave that one for, uh, for another show, but John, you know what, right. <laughs> you know what we'll do is, uh, I'm going to ask you any, uh, any last words before I let you go. I guess just basically keep staying safe. Um, any questions at any time, you feel free to reach me or, uh, my company is called Mangled Fly and I'm happy to help. You know, I've tested a lot of lines that FA has and happy to give you my input on it. So feel free to reach out at any time. Awesome. And John, where can people reach you at and where can they find you at? Yeah. So Mangled Fly is the name of my company. I have a website. I also try my best to be on social. Uh, so I have an Instagram account under Mangled Fly, also on Facebook. I've focused uh, doing some educational videos on YouTube and Vimeo, where there's some pretty good fly tying. Um, not so much the, uh, you know, short, quick stuff, but more like why are we wrapping the feather a certain way? Why are we adding flash blue at this step and kind of breaking down the fly over a longer series? Mm -hmm. so. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to make sure I put all that in the show notes. And uh, I definitely want to thank you. Super educational, a lot of fun, John. Uh, thank you, and thank you, listeners. You guys have been listening to Guided. Thanks, Greg. No worries. You've been listening to the Guided Podcast, sponsored by Scientific Anglers. If you like this podcast episode, please let us know and leave a review on your favorite podcast listening platform. And remember, subscribe to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast to get even more episodes of both Guided and the Fly Fishing Insider each week. See more at flyfishinginsiderpodcast.com.